2012 marks the 70th anniversary of a significant moment in Canadian history. One we may not be proud of, but one that needs to be remembered, today on The Express. Coming up, the 1942 War Measures Act sent Japanese Canadians into internment camps. Seventy years later, we remember. Forward on an inhale. And yoga heats up for a better community. I didn't really know where I was going with this. I mean, I've never written before. Then putting your story on the page, meet this first-time author. New beginnings, historical remembrances, the Express, your local voice. Welcome to the Express on Shaw TV. I'm your Sea to Sky host, Nicole Fitzgerald. Today, we're remembering 22,000 Japanese Canadians who were sent to internment camps in World War II. Many of them endured harsh living conditions, such as living in livestock facilities or tenting in winter season. But first, we're going to warm up with a little hot yoga. This new studio is not just about downward dog. It's about building community and going green. Forward on an inhale. From downward dog. Then you can bring your leg to 90 degrees. To warrior pose. You're sitting in a chair cross-legged. To whatever this is. Yoga is a popular way to strengthen your body and your mind. But this is no typical class. We're about to turn up the heat because this is hot yoga. We get the muscles really limber and the heart rate a little bit higher and just a little bit more detoxifying. This is Moksha Hot Yoga in East Van, a brand new studio run by two friends turned business partners. We always say that it's the healthiest relationship, romantic or otherwise, that we've ever had in our lives. <laughs> the classes here are open to beginners, <clears throat> all the way to the most seasoned yogi. The instructors start right where you are. So you're lifting in your belly and then they help you build and they help you refine your form and just move forward. And if you're feeling a little lost, there's always someone to look to for some help. It's a practice, so every day is different. Every day your body's different. With temperatures in the 30s, let's face it, a big part of hot yoga is the schwitzing. The best way the body can detoxify is through breathing and through sweating. I have never, ever, ever sweat so much in my entire life doing any kind of exercise. And, and there are showers in here, right? There are amazing showers in there, yeah. In fact, the showers and the entire yoga space from the bamboo floor to the clay walls reflect this duo's commitment to green building practices. We try to go as eco-friendly as we can. But beyond the green design and the health benefits of detoxing, Monique and Mary Eve want to build a sense of community. And they want everyone here to feel welcome. We do Tuesday cake day. We do yoga and then we eat a cake and we drink tea. We just bend and fold and try to find a little peace. <laughs> I'm Bianca Salterbeck in Vancouver for The Express. Namaste. Be sure to check out Karma Classes on Fridays. Admission is by donation. All proceeds benefit nonprofit organizations in Vancouver. The studio opening raised $500 for the Greater Vancouver Food Bank. Now we're going to head down to Britannia Beach. The BC My Museum has a new exhibit, which is shedding light on a very dark time in Canadian history. The exhibit really pays tribute to Japanese Canadians, especially the ones who were interned during World War II. We definitely want everybody to remember this time. Now what photo speaks to you the most? The one that really speaks to me is this one here. We went through a lot of photos from the National Nikai Museum in, in Burnaby, but this one just makes me feel a little bit sick at the conditions that these people were forced to live in. So this is at um, Hastings Park in Vancouver. Soon after the bombing of Pearl Harbor um, in 1941, in fact the day after, Canada started taking some action. During World War II, a War Measures Act was put in place and a 100 mile exclusion zone was declared in BC so that anybody of Japanese origin couldn't live within 100 miles of the coast. So they were shipped to internment camps and work camps and farms in the interior of BC and Alberta. So their entire life needed to be shoved into one little suitcase? They really needed to be selective about what they brought with them. Um, most things they had to leave behind and never saw it again. So what happened to their possessions? Most of them were sold off. Um, so there was talk that they would be saved for the people and then after the internment it would be given back to them, their houses, their car cars, all that kind of thing. But in the end they were sold off. By the government? Yeah. Living conditions, especially at the start, were really hard. 
tents in the middle of winter and things like that. People did really well at making the most of what they had and carrying on with lives. Now you may not know this, but there was actually a large Japanese Canadian population here in Britannia. And here are one of the faces. Uh, tell me about this artwork. This artwork is done by a woman named Arlie Wood. Um, and her grandmother lived in Britannia Beach and survived one of the big floods here, one of the big disasters, and then moved over to wood fiber across Howe Sound and was interned during World War II, like a lot of Japanese Canadians. We feel like this is important, especially this year. This year is the 70th anniversary of the internment. It's kind of a, a period in Canadian history that's hard to look at and hard to recognize, but we want to make sure that, that people are educated and, and know that this has happened. A single picture can say so much. This is an extremely powerful exhibit. Stolen Lives is on display until April 6 at the BC Mine Museum in Britannia Beach. Snow has inspired many pans in Whistler, including Stephen Vogler's Top of the Pass and Only in Whistler, a word nerd favorite. Everyone has a story. Everyone can tell a story, but not everyone takes the time to do it, unlike this first time author. I quite enjoyed it really. I mean, I had to put my character, it wasn't a lot of things it happened to my character, didn't happen to my mother. But in the end, the story finishes as she would have liked for her mom. First time author Diane Wilde had the story in her mind for years, but had just never gotten around to writing it down. We forget to do things for ourselves. We do it for everybody else, and women particularly. And we, we forget to stop and say, what would you really like to do? What would you enjoy? An impoverished home child, Diane's mom was sent to Canada from England in the early 20th century. Diane was always intrigued by her mother's story, but because her mom rarely spoke about the past, Diane had few specific details. So, a fiction book it would be. I didn't really know where I was going with this. I mean, I've never written before. I read a lot. I'm an avid reader, but I've never written myself. And then when I got it completed, I knew it wasn't good enough. I knew I needed to find some help. And that's when she connected with writing coach Wendy Dewar Hughes. The pair met at a coffee shop and the rest, as they say, is history. When Wendy worked with me, she, she didn't sort of make me feel like, well, you're an idiot, you know, you should have done this and that. We just worked together well. Sometimes I had to cut pieces out and send them back and say, rewrite this thing, this is no good. <laughs> you know, just different parts of the writing process that we worked through piece by piece. It's very hard to put yourself out there and saying, well, you know, I've written this story, and I think it's good enough to put on paper. So that's a big thing, a big step to take. Diane said that this is one of her goals, was to write this book and get her mother's story out there. And I feel very proud of her that she just took it and went, OK, I'm going to do this. And that's often what it takes. And though the now published paperback was years in the works, Diane flips back to reflect on her manuscript milestones and, of course, her mother. She's gone now, but it would be nice if she, I would love it if she could have seen it, you know, because she would be amazed to think there was a story. Because we all feel so ordinary, don't we, really? I mean, we don't feel that we've achieved anything, but, you know, we all achieve something. Everybody's got a story. Although Dan started out her journey wanting to tell a story inspired by her mother, she ended up with a lot more than just a book. She came away with a great experience and the hope that she will inspire future authors. In Harrison Hot Springs, I'm Tiffany Gurdon for Shaw TV. Forsaken Trust. It's about a child migration scheme in the early 1800s. Another way new writers can get inspired to scribble is by joining a local writers group. In Whistler, visit theviciouscircle.ca. It's free, and many of the participants have published books, including Stella Harvey, who has a new book coming out this fall. Next, let's head out to UBC, where we find Metro Vancouver host Johanna Ward. She says it's not about 15 minutes of fame, but 15. That's right, Nicole. The UBC Theatre program is rehearsing inside for their Brave New Playwrights Festival, where no play is longer than 15 minutes. It makes for some interesting experiments, which we'll show you later. <laughs> Thanks, Johanna. There's nothing like a night out of theatre. I wouldn't mind spending a little more time in this next story as well. After the break... This roughly two square kilometres of land ranks among the world's most expensive in terms of property values. Luxury living next to historic Stanley Park. I had to fill my car up yesterday and I nearly had a stroke. And tips from the universe on how to save gas. Nicole Fitzgerald's clothing provided by Peak Performance. Ski gear provided by Nordica. Hair styling by The Loft Salon. Makeup by Beauty Mark. Parking provided by the Fire Rock Lounge.